Hi, and welcome to According to Pete for I Don't Know When. Uh, we are recording this a couple days before AVC 2015. First thing I want to do today is to call out to the Hackaday Prize. This year is uh, build something to change the world and make things better and all that stuff. And the prize is something, the first prize is something like uh, $200,000 or a trip to space, they say. So um, definitely check that out. I also mentioned it because I happen to be one of the judges, along with a small host of people with bigger names than me. Beyond that, it's story time. Uh, a few months back, Somebody brought in a whole bunch of electronic junk. And me being me, the pack rat of all things, look, I could build something out of that. I went and I checked it out and I scored like spools of wire and big bags of components. I got diodes, I got caps, I got resistors, just like bags and bags of stuff. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, this is a small box that's sitting over here. This is like a whole thing of uh, one in 41, 48 diodes. It's a lifetime supply. I got a whole bunch of caps, caps. So I scored all this stuff and I'm looking at like what can I build? Ah, uh, what can I build? What can I build? I can build a charge pump. That's what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about a Dixon charge pump. Particularly I'm going to talk about that topology. There's a few different ones. Uh, there's the Cockroft Walton charge pump that was used in a particle accelerator design to generate high voltages to hurl stuff. Uh, these guys got a Nobel Prize uh, I think for the design or was it for the... A charge pump is a way to make higher voltages or, or multiples of a source voltage or even an inverse voltage without the use of an inductor. Why would you not want to use an inductor? Um, they're bulky, they can be expensive, they have their own problems when you set them up next to a cap. We talked about that in a previous episode. Charge pumps are typically used, well, <laughs> typically used, they're used in all kinds of applications. The one that you may be most familiar with uh, is uh, an RS-232 driver chip, right? Max-232, something like that, where to do a uh, proper RS-232 transmission, you need plus and minus like 15 volts. And I think the spec is like eight to 15 plus and minus. Um, and for a long time, it's been like a folk tale around engineering circles, how people will just buy the 232 driver just because they want the charge pump out of the chip. I'm not gonna drive it, I don't care about RS-232, I just want the voltages. So they buy that chip and they attach a couple of caps to it, bam, you get plus and minus 15. This is basically how a charge pump works and they're all kind of basically the same. You start out with a supply voltage. I've got five volts, just for the sake of argument. Diode and a cap, and that is sort of like considered one stage, and then this guy is called the output switch, and that's your output cap. This guy, you'll notice that guy isn't ground. Well, normally, you start with him being ground. Boy, that's the worst ground symbol I've ever seen. That cap charges up to, uh, neglect the diode for now, call it five volts. Say it charges up to five volts, okay? Now, once that's charged to five volts, you take that point and you raise that up to five volts. Now, you've got five volts here and you've got a plus and minus five volts here dumping into this cap. Now, you got 10 volts. It's like magic. I can't believe it, man. That's the basic principle of a charge pump. And what you can do is you can cascade many stages of this. And for every stage, you get another five volts, right? And the higher you start with, the more voltage you end up out here. This is the equation I'm working from. You like to say, like, if this were an ideal circuit, you would get N plus one times VDD, which is each stage, okay? So if this is a stage, you know, you've got uh, five volts, you get an extra five volts here, so you get 10 volts there. Now, this term, this is a lost term. This comes from an IEEE paper written by Gitano Palumbo and Domenico Papalardo. Gentlemen, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry I butchered your name. And of course, I added this one because you've really got diode drops here. You're not gonna end up with 10 volts out here. You're gonna end up with 8.8, .8, if you say 0.6 volts for each of these. In my case, I'm building this out of 1N4148s, 0.5 to 0.6 volts. So this is a more complete uh, picture of a Dixon charge pump. Uh, and this is very close to the circuit that I'm working with. I actually have uh, four stages one, two, three, four. This is my output switch. This is my output cap, okay? 
parts I'm using, again, 1N4148, because I got a brazillion of these things out of that garbage dump, and a 1.5 microfarad cap. Now, that cap is a little bit of an unknown, right? I'm, I'm building this stuff out of stuff that I got out of surplus, right? Why it's an unknown? I know it's 1.5 microfarad. I don't know its voltage rating. <laughs> Two clock signals, okay? So what you've got is a square wave that is 180 degrees out of phase. And the idea here, you remember the first circuit that I showed you, right? You, you dump it into one cap and then you bump that one, the low end of that cap up and it dumps into the next cap, all right? So the idea behind the two clock phases is that while you got one bit of charge moving down the chain, you got another one right behind it, okay? So you're constantly right into that guy, okay? Let's talk about this equation again. Now, this is probably a simplified equation, although I will tell you that it matched with my experiments pretty well. This loss term, I really like it because it's simplified. I'm not a huge believer in calculate, calculate, calculate before you throw a circuit down. I'm kind of like, you know what? Ballpark me, I want to put together and then I want to characterize. So this is the ideal bit. Ideally, you want N plus one times VDD to be your output. It's never gonna be that, okay? The obvious loss term is the diode drop. For every time I go through here, I'm gonna lose a diode drop to my output voltage. N being how many stages you have. Once again, I got one stage, two, three, four stages that are multiplying times IL. That's load current, right? That's all the current that's dumping out of here. Now, for the position in the equation, that term gets bigger the more load current you draw. Think of it in terms of a ripple voltage, okay? If I didn't have a load out here, this thing would be floating along real nice. As soon as I start drawing current off of this thing, you're gonna end up with a ripple voltage at your output, okay? That's, that's just how a rectified signal works on a cap, right? The more current you draw, the lower that voltage is gonna come. That's its position there, okay? T, T, one over F, right? That refers to the frequency of your clock, all right? I've already said these two guys are like 180 degrees out of phase. It's a 50% duty cycle. Uh, I don't know if that's optimal. The longer time your clock takes, the longer it takes to throw more charge into this cap and replenish it. So your loss term gets bigger. C, the bigger capacitance you're using, um, the more charge there is to draw from, it'll bump that up a little bit, okay? So the bigger your cap is, the smaller that term is going to be, the smaller your loss is going to be, okay? So this loss term makes a lot of sense to me. Technical considerations uh, about putting this circuit together. Across this cap, Right, it's gonna to charge to five and then you're raising, you're raising this up five volts and now there'll be 10 volts dumping into this one, okay? Where I'm going with this is, this cap is gonna have five volts across it, okay? This cap is gonna have 10 volts across it. 15, 20 to a final output, ideally of 25, okay? Why I mention this is because you gotta watch your cap ratings, your voltage ratings, all right? Like for example, when I told you I don't know the voltage rating of this cap. I'm guessing <laughs> that it's in the neighborhood of 50 volts, okay? So that has to be a consideration for me as I get farther and farther out here. The higher my voltage is, the more likely I'm gonna pop something and make some really interesting uh, TV. Now, the diodes, the blocking voltage is only gonna be like one, one switch. So you're gonna have like, you know, five volt blocking there, five volt blocking there. So the blocking for the switch isn't that critical because from stage to stage, you're only going up one increment of VDD. Now in the case of my 4148, the blocking voltage for that guy is like 75 volts continuous reverse blocking. Um, also a consideration is uh, its current ability. Uh, repetitive uh, peak current surge through 4148, I think is 500 milliamps. And when these things are, are recharging, it's gonna be, peak, it's gonna peak, right, a little bit. Now at this point, before I go any farther, before you build this circuit, and I am encouraging you to go build this circuit because it's fun, um, I gotta, maybe, maybe I'm a little bit of a wuss, but when, when, when voltages start getting big, I start getting careful, okay? Um, now, this, as it's drawn, and this is, this is like my first iteration, okay? Um, as it's drawn, I'm gonna get 
ideally 25 volts out of this. Uh, when I first did this, you know, the loss terms come into play, I was getting closer to like 22, which is cool. Mm, that's not really enough to make anybody happy, is it? So I wanted to augment this thing and I bumped it up a bunch, but I feel compelled to tell you if you're gonna poke at this thing, don't be stupid, okay? Watch, watch, your, watch your voltage rules. Don't go putting your finger in places that doesn't belong. If it's 25, I don't care. Um, 60, ultimately I got to 60. Mm, little care, but not a huge amount. Um, but as you can see, you can very easily get up to a very high voltage and you can shock the bejesus out of yourself if you're not careful. So that's my warning, now jump in. This was very close to my original circuit. My driving clock was actually generated from uh, one of our red boards, right? The Arduino clone that we use. Um, and it was just toggling back and forth at a low frequency, right? Something you should know, uh, these charge pumps often work at very high free, well, okay, into the megahertz. Eh, that's a high frequency. Um, I'm running, originally I was running at I don't know how many kilohertz, and I bumped it up uh, as much as I could, but originally I'm driving this thing with a red board. And the red board is good, I like it, I, it's, it's, it's a real good piece, but the timing of that clock was jittery as all, okay? So ultimately I switched to one of our free sock boards because I, I, I had one in my hands because I really want to learn how to use the, <laughs> the P-Sock chip. That thing has a lot of potential. But I switched to that and of course uh, 25 volts or 23 volts, that's not enough to make me happy. So uh, I looked for a way to increase that and the first way you just increase V plus. So ultimately I was running with 12 volts instead of five volts and I had to make a driver circuit for that because the IO on the PSOC chip will not drive a bridge, a PNP part at the top of a bridge. Here is the Dixon charge pump. Here is my driver circuit to achieve a greater output voltage. Now, why did I want 60 volts? There was a reason. Uh, we were testing some uh, LED filaments, right? And, and basically what they are, uh, I have an example of one, which is broken. It's basically a string of surface mount LEDs in this little thing, uh, which is cool, but it runs at like 60 volts, 60 volts. I wanted to see one work. In order to switch 12 volts, uh, remember that my, uh, my controller is now the PSOC, it's running at five volts, and I've got a bridge circuit here, and my parts are, uh, the bridge is comprised of a P2N2222. Note the P, different pinout than a 2N2222. Yes, that bit me, I learned a lesson. Uh, and on the low side, a 2N3904, okay? Now in order to switch the P channel, uh, I can't have the same 220 down to a pin on the PSOC. That ain't gonna work. So what I did was I switched it with another 2N3904, okay? So a high going signal on D2 turns this guy on. There are problems with this drive circuit. I'm always leery of bridges, right? And the reason is because if your timing is jacked on your signals, you run the risk of having a dead short between your supply and ground through your two components. That's kind of dumb, right? And as I'm striving for efficiency, I'm looking at the clock signals going like, okay, besides the obvious thing that I don't want a dead short from power to ground, I don't want the parasitic current going through here, right? I want all of my current going to the charge pump. I don't want to lose current through the bridge. So the timing becomes critical. And as you can see, D2 and D3 run double duty. D2, is running the top side on this bridge and the bottom side on this bridge, right? And logically you can see why, right? I'm trying to switch these things 180 degrees out of phase. So when one top turns on, the other top turns off. Same for D3, it runs the other two. That's kind of a no-no <laughs> because you're, you're never going to get them both to switch at the same time. There's always going to be a little bit of delay in the code. And so it increases the risk that I'm gonna have a spike of current from power to ground. Now, in the circuit that I built, I ultimately was able to achieve about an 87% efficiency. And what is, the, the thing about these charge pumps is that you can achieve like 90 to 95% efficiency depending on how you set this thing up. And I was pretty satisfied with 87%. And uh, so I decided to leave that alone. These turn on currents are not well matched. The logic behind that, that I was shooting for, 
is that I want to turn the part on hard enough that the bias currents do not come into the equation. It's just on. If I was going to actually design a product with a charge pump, I would be watching the timing much more carefully and I would be watching the bias currents much more carefully. One last note about the uh, component selection, uh, especially for the transistors. Um, 3904 rated to uh, 40 volts max from uh, emitter to collector. So I'm only blocking 12 volts max, that's good. Uh, the P2N2222, also 40 volts, so that's okay. Uh, pass current, the 3904 is rated for 200 milliamps. This guy is rated somehow for 600 milliamps. Okay, I'll take it, that's good. Um, so just something, to, just something to consider as you're putting together potentially a bridge like this. Watch your, uh, watch your, your, your maxes, make sure you don't go over them, unless you're trying to light something on fire, then go nuts. So here's the circuit, just to, just to prove that I did this, right? So as you can see on the uh, meters, my input is 12.28 currently, my output is 54.9. Uh, which is not 60, but I am loading this thing, so it's not a huge surprise. Uh, my PSOC, my free sock 2 board. Man, I got hopes for you. We've got plans, baby. Um, and on the breadboard, here are my bridge circuits right here. Here are the two uh, driving transistors for the high side of the bridges, the PNPs. And here's the charge pump. There's uh, the top input um, uh, diode, the 4148 and the string of them. Now I should explain, I've got like big long wires in here so that I could easily take measurements. I didn't actually take all those measurements right there. Um, but we will talk about efficiency in a sec. Here, we talked about the LED filaments. These are the LED filaments. Uh, and I should explain this, uh, and hopefully the picture shows, you can kind of see, since I've got uh, the, uh, the static bag on top of it, you can see how the each each LED is like visible. Um, now that brings up an interesting point. I don't have a load resistor for these things. They are um, rated at 60 volts and this thing is sort of self-limiting. It's gonna draw the current or draw the voltage down in order to supply enough current and it's gonna reach some equilibrium. And that's what's happening here. Now I've also got all these 10Ks over here because I wanted to you know, load this thing down a bit more and see how the efficiency changed versus how much current I was drawing. Um, and it's not a real big surprise. Uh, you know, I, I, I draw more current and I get better efficiency. Why it doesn't surprise me is because I could probably have a whole bunch of parasitics in these bridges that I'm not gonna get around, and that's my denominator. So the more I bring up my numerator with a load current, the more my efficiency is going to increase. As this thing sits currently, I am drawing about 14.3 milliamps out of this thing with 73.2 going in, which gives me, remember efficiency, uh, power in over power out, right? That's, that's what it is. Um, and I'm running at about 87% efficiency with this circuit as it stands. Now, it's worth a mention, you know, each of these diodes is, you know, half, half a volt of, of, of drop that I'm losing. So if I chose a better switch, like a MOSFET or something, I could get better efficiency out of this. But what the heck, I had a whole bunch of 4148s, so that's what I used. And yeah, oh, I should mention, uh, my period, my clock uh, period is running at about 26 microseconds. So I'm in, I'm in tens of kilohertz there. Um, and uh, yeah, and if I, if I increase that clock frequency, and I watch this, I have several iterations of, of, of this, and as I raise clock frequency, I do get better output, I do get better efficiency, so that is clear. Now, worth a mention, uh, and I did not mention it before, um, you remember the loss term that had uh, capacitance value in the uh, denominator, right? And what that says, what that indicates to you is like the bigger cap value you get, the less that loss term is gonna be. Well, true, but um, you, you might go like, I'm gonna put 100 microfarad caps in there. Well, you might not wanna do that quite so much because uh, ESR of the cap is going to become an issue at some point. Also, the bigger value of capacitor, the more charge it's gonna take, which is good if you got a big output load. 
Um, but something to consider. Uh, the reason these values got picked, number one, they were available for free. Number two, they're not too far off of what I've seen on uh, any given RS-232 driver, right? Those are typically point ones. Eh, let's try this and see how it works. So what I got, again, 87% efficiency. Uh, oh, I should probably also mention, if I haven't done so already, uh, my efficiency measurements, right? I take current, because I'm running uh, uh, at, at you know, a relatively high frequency, I'm taking my current measurement straight at the input to the breadboard. Now, I'm not taking into consideration the PSOC board. That one, I call that a freebie. But everything that's coming into this breadboard, I count that against the efficiency. And I'm, I am measuring it with a meter, but the meter is going to average the current because the frequency is so high. So I'm cool with that. That's charge pumps. Well, that's a Dixon charge pump. Well, that's the one I built. <laughs> Thanks again for sticking with me through all this. Uh, hope you had as much fun as I did. Please go check out the Hackaday Prize if you have not yet. Uh, in the meantime, thanks again. If you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the comment section below, or you can send them to feedback at sparkfun.com with according to Pete in the subject line. And until next time, peace.